the Atlantic Crossing Guide provides an overview of a passage that frankly is harder in the planning than it is in the actual execution. I mean crossing the Atlantic is not an outward bound course and I, I, I think it's frequently harder sailing in the English Channel or the North Sea than it is doing a transatlantic. The challenges are different of course. You've got the, um, the challenges of all the preparation uh, and the fact that you're going to spend days and nights at sea but you just get used to it. It actually becomes a very very nice way of life. Um, I love long passages, I absolutely love long passages. Almost any well-found boat can make this passage. Clearly the larger the boat is um, the quicker you're going to make the, uh, the quicker you're going to make the trip. The distance from the Canaries to the West Indies is uh, 2,800 miles, so it's going to take you around um, three weeks to make the uh, to make the transit if you're if you're doing five knots. You'll probably do more, but I, I base everything on sort of five knots. Um, you you can expect the trade winds to be blowing from astern at 15 to 20 knots day and night the whole time. Occasionally they're going to gust up to around 30 knots, maybe a little bit more, at which point you just furl one of the headsails um, and slow your boat, slow your boat down and from 30 knots minus 5 or 6 knots, you know, you've only got 24, 25, 20, 20 knots um, apparent. You're actually more, prob more problematically going to get light winds uh, as you get south, uh, as you're trying to head south to find the trade winds, uh, which can slow you down considerably. When you get to the other side, there are um, there's a choice of a load of islands that you can stop at in the um, in the entire island chain. Um, you you don't have to be committed to going into Rodney Bay, St Lucia at all. If you want to go to Barbados, if it's your intention to visit Barbados, then it ought, you ought to make that your first stop because otherwise you're never going to get there because it's upwind from the west of the West Indy Islands. Um, after Barbados, yeah, straight on across is uh, St Lucia, but um, my favourite is Grenada. The lagoon in Grenada is a lovely, lovely anchorage. The yacht club there are really friendly and you can leave your dinghy with them when you want to go in town and do shopping or just look at the place. Um, Grenada is really, really good news. Another possibility is uh, Antigua. Um, Nelson's Bay in Antigua is uh, very elegant, very smart, bit touristy and not that cheap but it's, uh, it's very nice and a very good introduction to the, uh, to the West Indies or you can go even further north to where all the charter fleets are up by um, Tortola in the British Virgin Islands. So there is a whole range of places that you can aim for and I guess part of your planning is um, deciding which one, uh, which one attracts you the most. Because you're following a trade wind route into a hurricane zone, your weather window uh, for going across is constrained at the end of it by the fact that June is the month when the hurricanes are really are beginning to get going and you don't want to be caught out in the Atlantic if there's one uh, on its way. The earliest you can go is around um, November because um, the trade winds don't really st start, don't really get up to their sort of full normal trundling along wet trade winds until, um, until December. You can start a bit earlier, you can start in November which is what the ARC does out of the Canary Islands. They start around the 20th of November. The main reason they start a bit early is that they want to get their fleet across the Atlantic and into um, Rodney Bay um, for a Christmas party or before Christmas so that's the reason they start a bit early um, and it's yeah it's a valid reason but that also means that you really do not want to be in the Canary uh, well you don't want to be in uh, Gran Canaria the Las Palmas area um, before the 20th of November because the ARC boats start piling into that marina I mean like There'll be 300 of them there each year and they just take over the place. There are no room, there is no room for anywhere else. Having said that, 
there's no reason why you have to leave from Gran Canaria. You can leave from any of the other islands if the Canaries are your chosen point of departure. Many couples sell their boats to, say, the Canaries or possibly Madeira um, themselves uh, because they're it's what they do, they're a cruising couple, and they uh, then fly crew in um, to help them with the transatlantic part of the voyage, which is uh, a very a very good and sensible thing to do. Um, many hands make light work. Um, so the Canaries are a good place to do that from. Madeira is possible, although it's quite a long way to the airport, um, or you can do the crew change in Gibraltar, of course. Um, I when I've needed crew, um, I've used a company called Crew Seekers International, which are a UK based company, and it's totally free of charge to skippers. Um, you just put an advert up on their website, and um, crew then apply to you. Um, or, yeah, I think that's the way it works. They apply to you, and then you can interview them, get their details, and so on, and then select them or not. I always make crew pay for their um, their own transport to to me to wherever the boat is and back. It's when you're selecting crew, it's important to make sure they have the that you think they've got the funds to get back to uh, the UK or back to their home wherever it is, uh, because um, you're responsible for them. Um, a country is not a country in the West Indies. Some West Indian countries. West Indies countries are not going to let them land if they uh, haven't got an air ticket out um, or something. They, they just don't want sort of packers arriving or living off the system or whatever off a boat and you are legally responsible for them until they get off the boat. Um, in fact with people carrying sort of Irish or British passports it's not too much of a problem but some other passports um, can present a difficulty so that's a problem worth looking at um, and the deal I normally strike with the crew is that there is no deal um, if they don't like me if they find me awful then they can get off the boat at absolutely any time they like and if I don't like them um, I can ask them to leave at any time I I like uh, which is maybe a reason for having them on board before you set out across the Atlantic because that rule becomes a bit um, bit difficult to enforce if you're going to cross as uh, single-handed or just as a couple then obviously you're going to need to um, to get sleep you're going to set alarms at night um, and 24 7 watch keeping is impossible so if you've got other people on board three or four two or three um, more then uh, obviously that makes life a, a lot easier in terms of watch keeping um, I think four is probably the ideal number frankly the chances of bumping into anything out there are tiny absolutely minute uh, big ships don't use the uh, the routes that um, we use uh, for our crossings there's very little transatlantic traffic out there and if there are ships out there they're running their radar and their AIS and all the rest of it and they're going to honk at you or they're going to alter course or they're going to call you on VHF 16 um, the chances of getting run down out in the Atlantic because you're asleep are in my opinion so tiny they're hardly worth bothering about you're probably going to have to modify your boat for downwind sailing um, with the wind blowing constantly from astern the last thing in the world you want is a great big boom with a mainsail on it uh, crashing around you really need to have twin headsails um, boomed out or held out in some way or other um, you've probably already got one spinnaker pole so that's fine for the uh, furling jib but you're going to need to acquire a second jib, uh, which can be a second hand one because you're only going to do this, uh, you're only going to use it for this transatlantic passage for the three weeks or so, probably less, that you're at sea. So um, you're going to need a second, you're going to need a second headsail, which can be a new one or a second hand one. And clearly, you can just buy another, a second spinnaker pole and use that for uh, holding it out. 
there is an alternative to that because the second spinnaker pole it's not buying the pole that's a problem the problem is you've then got to get into all the mast fixings and you've got to get all the fixings on the mast for the uh, for the spinnaker pole so there's there's quite a good alternative which I've used um, which I used last time which is that you use the main boom to hold out to um, bear out the second head saw uh, so if you're going to do that at the end of the boom you need to have a fixing so that you can put a preventer on the boom um, which you're then going to run forward and that will stop the boom um, coming back in into the cockpit and crashing around and you're going to need a block to run the sheet of the second furling jib through and back to the cockpit so you then fix the second jib anywhere the foot of the second jib goes anywhere on the foredeck as close as possible to the furling drum but obviously not touching it obviously not interfering with it so uh, somewhere close to the furling drum you uh, fix the foot of the um, the sail I mean obviously there can be a bit of string to get it up to the same sort of height as the other one and then you just hoist it on the uh, on the spinnaker halyard um, I never attach it to the forestay I know you know I mean I just never never do that it's just totally unnecessary because if you haul it up pretty tight it actually sets fine and yes you'll have a bit little bit of a gap um, between the two sails but it really really doesn't matter and that once you get into the trades and you start downwind sailing that works absolutely brilliantly and then if the wind does gust up you can just roll in the furling headsail easily nobody has to go on deck um, and you're down to just one sail um, one headsail so um, that's uh, that's what I do that's the way I do it now and I think it's uh, I think it's uh, I think using the boom is an excellent solution the next important thing is the steering gear clearly you're not going to helm because the longest anybody can uh, helm on a compass course efficiently is I don't know a couple of hours maybe three hours and if you have any two of you or three of you or four of you it's uh, it's you know it's a real problem almost all boats these days have got um, electric or steering gears on board and provided they are top of the range and ideally fixed to the quadrant and not the wheel um, or the tiller uh, provided they're fixed to the quadrant um, they are pretty efficient um, I think it's important they're fixed to the quadrant because then you're not trying to transmit all that energy down the wheel and all the cables in order to get to the quadrant first, uh, second um, if the push me pull you bar is um, down there on the quadrant it will um, it's working directly on it and yes it still has to turn the wheel and the cables but I reckon it uses far less power and generally speaking those are more powerful motors your problem is if they break down you've got a problem so you either need to carry spares for your electric self steering gear a total set of spares or you need to carry maybe a total second um, self steering gear electric self steering gear electric autopilot the problem with that is because um, autopilots which are much more efficient these days have become so complex it's actually quite difficult to fit one uh, because of the electronics because of um, integrating it into to all the systems um, so you can't just have a standalone it's difficult to have a standalone autopilot electric autopilot um, they tend to be integrated in the system and I think fitting one is probably quite tricky but if you written you can do it then absolutely fine that's the way forward personally um, I prefer wind self steering gears um, I've, I've owned a boats with an Aries a wind pilot and finally a hydrovane the wind pilot was uh, fine um, it uh, it worked well um, slightly complicated in its in, in its system of operating but it was fine until its little plastic um, bearings swelled up and then it wasn't fine the Aries was okay 
and the hydrovane was absolutely brilliant. I mean, the design is so clever and so simple. Uh, as you can see, it it, um, it has its own rudder in the water, so as the vane walks backwards and forwards, it directly changes its little rudder in the water, and that alters your course back onto um, the course uh, according to the wind. Um, it's an excellent design. Uh, they're not cheap. They are very much the Rolls Royce of wind cell steering gears, but um, mine mine took me around the world, and um, I totally totally relied on it. Whatever happens, whether you are using electric cell steering gear or wind vanes of uh, some sort or another you're going to use amps you're going to have your navigation lights you're going to have um, you're going to have probably VHF 16 just on you're going to have you're going to use electricity so you've got to you've got to have some way of um, supplying yourself with electricity without shore power and without the engine running for three weeks clearly enlarging your battery bank is a solution uh, well is part of the solution um, if there's room I would install another one or two um, house batteries service batteries if you can but n nonetheless you're going to need to charge you're going to need to charge them most round-the-world boats single-handed Vendee Globe for example charge their batteries with ge built-in generators. They have a generator with a fuel tank running for an hour or two almost every day. Yes, they've got their main engine sealed and yes, they don't use any propulsion power, but they do actually have generators running constantly, uh, running frequently whilst they're doing their um, wind sailing. It's expensive and the, you need quite a large boat to find a place to put the generator. So the solution to that is that you've got wind generators um, and I've had several types. Um, they are okay. When it gets really windy they get really noisy. They can even be noisy, they can even be noisy just at night. When you're downwind sailing, of course, the amount of wind going into them is greatly reduced, so their output is reduced. And when you're on anchorage, uh, when you're on anchorage, clearly you find anchorages which are out of the wind, and so the wind generator doesn't do that much power. And um, in the end, I've I've given up on wind generators, but solar panels, on the other hand, are brilliant. The the um, the powerfulness of solar panels has, for you know, for the money and for the size, has increased enormously in recent years. And good solar panels are absolutely wonderful. So if you can have one or two solar panels, and the flat ones are better than the flexible ones, if you have one or two solar panels fixed permanently on the boat, um, working through a controller of some sort, this one's here is quite old-fashioned but um, you do need some sort of um, you need controllers on them and then you need methods of looking at your batteries you need some sort of um, um, amperage uh, monitor so you can see what volts are going in what volts are going out how many amps there are in the battery and so on so you need a battery controller as well communications in the Atlantic are very very different from um, in the Mediterranean or in the English Channel or, or coasting around on three or four day passages. Um, the, the, there are only two choices. Um, you can have a satellite telephone, um, a handheld one, um, linked into a laptop um, for um, emails and so on. Uh, or you can have a single sideband radio with a Pactor modem linked into a laptop for uh, weather faxes and um, emails and so on the initial cost of a single sideband radio oh, the initial cost of a satellite telephone is less than a single sideband um, and it really doesn't need much uh, much fitting or much work doing to it other than finding a system of keeping its batteries charged um, either by 12 volt charger or an inverter 
the cost of a single sideband radio is higher and in addition you need an antenna tuner which you need to hide away um, somewhere and you need a backstay aerial um, running the uh, antenna cable to the, um, to your backstay and fitting isolators in the backstay. That's actually, since the days of stay lock uh, fittings, well, the isolators come with stay lock fittings. Um, it's really not difficult. I've done, um, I fitted three myself and I'm no sort of great shakes at DIY. Um, so it's, that part of it is fairly straightforward. The cost of running a satellite telephone is eye-watering. The charges are phenomenal and you certainly don't want to be chatting away to your friends on it and even emails, even emails cost money. The costs of running a single sideband are absolutely negligible. There's a tiny, tiny fee to um, the company that relays the um, emails into your factor modem, but other than that the cost of running it is absolutely zero and you can chat away to your neighbours. With your single sideband you can keep in you can keep in touch with Dover Coast Guard if, if that's what you need to do. Um, there is an emergency frequency which is the equivalent of channel 16 called 2182 and 2182 um, is theoretically monitored by all merchant ships uh, ever since the Titanic when nobody was listening. Um, and you can call on 2182 and you'll get through to the Coast Guard uh, exactly as you would as if you used a satellite phone to call an emergency. Uh, and 2182 will enable you to communicate with other merchant ships as well um, who should be monitoring it should you need it, which you know I sincerely hope you won't and is very, very unlikely. Having got to the Caribbean with your single sideband, um, it is the way, it is the radio the, of, of choice of blue water cruisers. Uh, if you want to talk to your friends, chat to your friends, if you want to listen to nets and things, uh, maritime nets, not ham, uh, listen to maritime nets, then, to, uh, then uh, the single sideband frequencies are around and it's the way to keep in touch. You don't need an operator's license. Um, you do need how to work out how to use it um, and there are dummy books for that but um, nobody's going to ask you for your operator's license nobody's going to um, and in America and in the West Indies you are not legally required to have an operator's license nobody talks about an operator's license in the United States of America or indeed the West Indies so um, personally uh, I would fit a single sideband radio and keep in touch with the world if I carry an EPIRB um, all the time in all my boats. However, um, 85 to 90 percent of all EPIRB alerts are false alarms. They've been set off accidentally or they've just fallen, fallen overboard from a merchant ship or whatever. The Coast Guard, when they receive an EPIRB alert, spend an awful lot of time trying to ascertain whether it's a real alert or not and they are very loath to divert merchant ships to the EPIRB position uh, for obvious reasons, for obvious commercial reasons. In the boat Bambola, which um, there's a bit of film of here, I installed a fresh water hand pump and I installed a salt water hand pump. Um, I installed the fresh water hand pump because I didn't want people in the heads being able to just switch on the fresh water in order to wash their hands. Um, fresh, water, fresh water takes an awful lot of space in the boat and a lot of weight in the boat and is a valuable. You know, fresh water is the most important um, thing there is in the boat actually, um, ultimately and it mustn't be wasted and so using having just one hand pump to access the fresh water in the galley seems a sensible way forward to me and at the same time I installed a salt water pump um, which I very simply just teed into the water inlet to the heads 
uh, which happened to be just the other side actually of the uh, bulkhead and I just teed into the um, the, uh, the heads water inlet, inlet and put a salt water pump in there so that all the washing up and things like that could be done with salt water. You don't want to cook in it because it ruins potatoes and pasta but um, it's great for washing up. I installed a galley strap. Um, it, you don't use them that frequently but um, gosh they can be really really useful when you do need them um, and I installed a lee cloth uh, I absolutely recommend lee cloths um, if as skipper I always sleep in the saloon I'm always uh, close to the uh, close to where the action is and um, you need a lee cloth to uh, to ensure getting some decent sleep navigation is a whole load different um, out in the Atlantic or on passages of more than five or six days uh, away from land uh, than it is um, than that which we've sort of normally experienced. The chart plotter is absolutely useless, pointless running it. Um, there's nothing to see, it's just ocean, nothing to see at all. So what you need is a little um, GPS. Uh, they no longer make them but I had one that had a little screen and a rolling road on it and it plugged into the 12 volt uh, boat system and that was uh, beside the helm so what you were navigating, what you were steering with, what you were when you were on watch, what you were checking to make sure that you were still on course with was that little GPS and it's using it's using a minute amount of, um, of, uh, of amps tiny amount um, and is and it's just much easier to see um, there are little handheld GPS's now like that which are um, battery driven um, and all I would say is um, they're absolutely fine uh, because they, they will just play a rolling road as well and they're, they're, they're really good little machines but you but they do need to be there does need to be some way of powering them that's not batteries um, because they're going to be on 24-7 night and day and with the backlight on at night um, so you'll be going through an amazing amount of batteries so you need to find a way of powering them out of the boat system. My laptop and I think most of us have laptops in our boats these days and if you've got um, either a satellite phone or a single sideband you're going to need a laptop in order to download the emails uh, into them. In my laptop I have OpenCPN which is a absolutely brilliant free of charge and because it's free of charge it doesn't mean it's second rate in any way whatsoever. OpenCPN has been designed by a load of yachties in the States who were who are IT experts and they've designed this charting system which is absolutely brilliant to use. It's brilliant for planning, I use it for planning all the time and if you attach a GPS dongle to your laptop uh, uh, which I which I have uh, just sort of stuck up on a window there um, it becomes a chart plotter and it gives you your course your speed your direction absolutely everything so it is a it is a backup navigational aid I log my position in the Atlantic or in the Pacific at noon each day because it's traditional um, the lat long. I just want to know what the lat long is at noon each day. Coming off watch I ask everybody who's been on watch, all the watch keepers and myself, when I come off watch I note the lat and long position, uh, I note what the barometer is um, and I note um, the sea state and anything that's going on. If all your electronics fail the whole lot and it can happen if you get hit by lightning you're going to get the whole thing wiped out um, there can be other reasons for total failure of it all but um, let's say that happens if you know your last position within 24 hours or better still four hours if you know your last known position you can just use DR dead reckoning to get yourself to the Indies watch keeping absolutely depends on the size of the crew. I've never done it but uh, myself 
but I know people who um, have just gone to bed at night uh, in the Atlantic um, as the sun sets um, they've put the autopilot on and gone to bed um, I suspect they may have switched on their radar so that it scans intermittently um, every half hour or hour um, and there's a little alarm on it that goes beep 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 if it gets an echo uh, but they just go to sleep what I've done when I've been totally alone is that I've slept um, day and night for about an hour um, half an hour to an hour depending on um, the proximity of I suspect of other things um, I have an egg timer which I wind up um, and I'm in the cockpit curled up in a sleeping bag with some cushions and I go to sleep and every half an hour or three quarters of an hour whatever the uh, egg timer goes off I get up I have a look around check the uh, check the horizon check the course check the still on course set the alarm clock set the egg timer and go back to sleep again and actually if you do that day and night <coughs> excuse me even with um, even with cooking and things like that you actually get an awful lot of sleep I've I've done that for days and days and days and days and, and not gotten the least tired if there are two of you you can um, share it you can go uh, either three hours on three hours off or four hours on four hours off um, Louise and I used to do four hours on four hours off uh, and got stacks of sleep you actually in your four hours off you don't get four hours sleep of course because um, you always wake the other person um, ten minutes before uh, their watch is due and you put the kettle on and you make them coffee or cocoa or whatever it is that they they like to wake up to um, and then you change watch and you tell them what's been going on uh, and then you go down and you write the log um, and then you finally um, climb yourself into the bunk curl up pull up the lee cloth and go to sleep and then you get woken 10 minutes early so three hours is probably the uh, maximum sleep that you actually ever get but that works fine and um, Lulu and I used to go for days and days and days on that without feeling really fatigued um, obviously in the daytime um, you're both up together and you're having lunch together so it's lovely um, once there are three or four of you you can do you can do things like um, three hours on six hours off and then everyone is getting um, a lot of sleep I'm fairly old-fashioned and I don't allow people to wear um, headsets uh, while they're on watch um, I don't allow people to listen to their music while they're on watch um, I think that watch keeping also includes your um, audio senses and it's important to be able to hear if something breaks if something snaps it's important to be able to hear if the sound of the wind changes it's important to be able to hear the sound of the sea changes food and water are pretty big issues um, a human being can survive on about three liters of water a day but that includes the liquids that they're getting in um, coffee tea uh, milk in breakfast cereal fruit juice and things like that in my opinion water makers for an Atlantic passage are not really necessary um, they're expensive they're difficult to install uh, they need constant attention with chemicals and filters um, and you have to run the engine in order to power the water maker and water makers really want to be used daily in order to keep themselves going properly uh, I have one in the South Pacific and uh, for a while in the Caribbean and yes it had its use uh, but I certainly wouldn't rush to install one for an Atlantic crossing a human being needs three liters of water a day so the total amount of water needed um, for a passage say between the Canary Islands and the West Indies um, assuming a 24-day passage well let's call it 30 days in case uh, something goes wrong um, is 105 litres per crew member now a crew of four is going to need 420 litres of water my present uh, little boat um, only holds 160 litres of water in its main tank so clearly I have to do something about that now jerry cans 
tied on deck um, hold around plastic jerry cans hold around 22 litres so a dozen or so of those will solve that problem it's it's also better to and of course you can have water in uh, which you can buy in the supermarket in plastic bottles stowed away inside the boat as well it's better to have your water in lots of different small containers just in case the big container breaks I allow the crew uh, and myself um, half a litre of water a day for washing and cleaning your teeth um, and that's issued in a little plastic bottle everybody has a little plastic bottle and they fill up their half water from the fresh water pump um, each morning in order to uh, for their ablutions food is not quite so important because I guess at the very worst um, if you ran out of food you could start fishing and also a human being can go for 10 days without food without uh, without dying there are occasionally when you get towards the West Indies you'll find flying fish on deck um, and um, you can make a breakfast of them as well so the same formula works for food as for water um, except it's a bit more extensive you need food for breakfast food for lunch and food for dinner um, I think luncheon is the main meal of the day and it's I think it's an important meal because it's a, it's a time when all the crew are normally awake and you can commune together and chat together and it's 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 good communing time for crews lunchtime um, so the same thing works out so for a 30-day passage you need 30 breakfasts, 30 lunches and 30 dinners uh, breakfast can just be cereal or, um, or an egg or something like that lunch I think should be a more important meal um, and dinner can just be some sort of a snack um, towards sunset in this day and age you can get stacks of um, you can get stacks of um, tin food uh, tin meals and um, dried meals and so on uh, which are absolutely fine you're going to have so many you're going to need to have a list of where they're stowed throughout the boat because clearly your food is going to be stowed in different lockers in different parts of the boat and um, okay it's fine when you're stowing it but when you're out in the middle of the sea and you're looking for a, um, a tin of um, a tin of mints to make a spag ball um, it's very irritating if you can't find the spag when you buy eggs um, you need to buy fresh eggs eggs that have not been in a freezer uh, because eggs that have not been in a freezer survive very well they'll survive for your four-week passage uh, but if they've been in a the freezer they won't um, don't know why but that's what it is with eggs vegetables fresh vegetables will um, start off with the trip and they need to be hung up in a net like the uh, one in Bambola um, and curry powder is good if you're into curry at all curry powder curried almost anything is absolutely excellent making your own bread is um, very possible even I can make uh, bread in a boat um, you just need to buy the tins for it um, and the uh, flour um, and olive oil rather than butter and the yeast and off you go you can make fresh bread and you become the most popular person in the crew when you've made fresh bread it smells delicious and as the cook chef who's made the bread you're the one that cuts it and shares it out because everybody wants their slice so the next important thing is where do you buy the food and clearly um, somewhere like Morrison's in Gibraltar which has that shop has traditionally been a place where transatlantic people stock up for the passage Morrison's is good because we Brits um, major in uh, tin food and packaged food and so on so um, a reason to go to Gibraltar uh, is to stock up with food from Morrison's and bring at least three trolley loads back in a taxi and fill up the boat with duty-free fuel which is uh, there's no mean savings to be had uh, duty-free fuel in Gibraltar is very very inexpensive my experience with Spanish and Portuguese uh, supermarkets is they're just uh, wonderful food stuff but they're just not so good on um, 
ready meals uh, good on rice good on pasta and obviously good on uh, fresh vegetables and so on gas is a problem um, and there's not a really easy solution to it color gas is only available in the UK can't get it anywhere else in the world the only way you can refill a color gas cylinder is by going to a gas manufacturing place uh, a gas factory and getting them to fill it for you camping gas on the other hand is available throughout Europe and is very inexpensive it's about 17 euros 20 euros um, to swap the bottle and in my experience the bottles last as long as the bigger uh, color gas bottles to convert to camping gas is quite easy because um, they run off their own regulator which screws onto the uh, top of the bottle and then there's a rubber tube coming up and you can just fit that rubber tube into your gas system quite easily and you can get camping gas cylinders anywhere in Europe but in the West Indies no in the West Indies and America there is another gas system and the bottles the basic bottles are much bigger they're they're considerably bigger than a Cala gas bottle and um, the fittings there's no tube fittings it's all done by pipes and screws and nuts and bolts and the systems are different the, the they're not metric they're not British standard they're a different American system and I had an awful job um, converting when I was in the States with the boat I had a real mega battle um, converting to um, converting the tubing so that it would accept um, American gas so I don't offer a solution for that if you're going to spend time in Europe absolutely change to camping gas and if you go to the Calagas website you'll find there's a um, gizmo you can buy which does the conversion but personally I've, I, I've just fit the tube into my system for the actual Atlantic crossings there are three possible departure points there's Madeira there's the Canary Islands and there's the Cape Verde Islands getting to the start line for November December um, is part of the planning problem clearly you don't need to, you don't want to be crossing Biscay in the winter because you're uh, you're going to get beaten up um, I've I've crossed Biscay a dozen times uh, the latest time was September October um, but I'm a board card I sit in a port like um, Plymouth Foy or the City Isles and wait until I've got a five-day weather forecast um, and with modern forecasting five days is pretty accurate <laughs> the trip across Biscay to Bayona is five days so I've sat there waiting for a five-day good forecast and gone I always head to Bayona because it's around Capo Finisterre and it sets you up nicely for going down the uh, Portuguese the Portuguese coast or going across to Madeira it's also a nice place to visit if you did get caught out towards the end of the five-day crossing then uh, you could go into Corinna which is nice which is nice enough easy to get into and a nice marina but uh, personally I'd head into Bayona from Bayona there are a couple of choices it's your first decision point you can head out to um, Madeira which is about 700 miles um, and go into either Funchal Harbour or the marina there uh, there's a marina just up the coast from there and enjoy the island it's really nice restock refuel and depart from there I've departed from um, Funchal one time absolutely excellent it just puts another 70 miles on the voyage and frankly when you're doing 2,000 miles it's you know another 70 is neither here nor there the next place to go to from Bayona as an alternative is Gibraltar um, and Gibraltar is a about five days sail six days sail non-stop from Bayona down the Portuguese coast or alternatively there are ports and harbors and marinas every 50 miles or so so you could very well spend a summer time cruising down the um, down the Portuguese coast even around the Algarve in order to get yourself to Gibraltar just before the uh, crossing season starts so from Gibraltar having um, filled up with food and filled up with fuel you're going to set off to either the Canaries or possibly the Cape Verdes non-stop to the Canaries is a five-day sail 
and as I say you can choose any of the Canary Islands to go to. There are wind acceleration zones around the Canaries. You'll be going along in 15 knots and all of a sudden it's 30 knots or you can see a line of white water on the horizon and that's a wind acceleration zone but apart from those the Canaries are pretty easy cruising. Alternatively you can go down the Moroccan coast and that is absolutely delightful. I just adore Morocco and it's a really good experience going down that coast. You can depart from Gibraltar, sail across to Tangier, check into, check into Morocco in Tangier, have a couple of days in Tangier enjoying the soup, the souk, uh, the market. There's a new international marina there so there's all facilities. Come out of Tangier, go around Capo Espartal and then all the way down the coast there are ports that you can stop at. Agadir, um, Casablanca, which is actually a major industrial port. There's, I certainly couldn't find Harris Bar there, but there is a little marina in the corner, or there's a marina um, just before Casablanca you can go into. And then all the way down to uh, a place called Tantan, which is really the southernmost port in Morocco. And from there you can go across, uh, it's just an overnight sail to Lanzarote. I wouldn't recommend going down the African coast beyond Tantan out of Morocco because politically and with the refugee problem um, it's probably not that secure. Alternatively from Tantan or indeed the Canary Islands you can head down to the Cape Verdes and that's about 900 miles down to a place called Mindelo where there's a uh, marina. The marina has got a couple of local supermarket type shops nearby to uh, restock and refuel at but it's a you know it's a modern little marina. The staff are delightful and really welcoming and it shortens yeah it shortens the uh, transatlantic passage. So these are the alternative departure points. There's Madeira, the, any of the Canary Islands or the Cape Verdes. In order to get practique, permission to enter the country uh, when you arrive in, um, in a foreign country, and that actually includes now Europe for us Brits, um, Morocco um, and the Cape Verdes, uh, in order to get practique you fly the yellow flag under the um, local courtesy flag and the smaller the country is the more important it thinks its courtesy flag is. You show your clearance paper from the last port together with the crew list and all their passports. In most marinas these days they will ask you for a certificate of insurance. Uh, they're interested in third-party insurance. Um, whether you choose to insure your boat or not, that's you know that's entirely up to you. But um, third-party insurance has become pretty obligatory. So, in a way, that's it. I mean, laden with spares, food, lots of water, um, you set off for a passage across the Atlantic, and there's really not a lot to be said to it. Once you once you get yourself into the trade winds and you've got the two headsails up, you just sit back, lie back and think of England really. It's lovely. It's absolutely delightful. It is the most pleasant way to spend two or three weeks. You'll love it. Rolling down the seas as they come up from astern. Um, it's just lovely. Stars at night are fantastic flying fish on deck in the morning are romantic and when you get to the West Indies it's a cruising ground you can spend your life in. Lots of people do. You can spend your whole lifetime cruising in the West Indies and frankly they're very cheap, very inexpensive and being on Anchorage is actually nicer than being in a marina. Getting back to Europe is a uh, different uh, a different route and a set of very different problems. By this time of course your boat's already set up for transatlantic sailing uh, and you're a very experienced person and the only decision really is um, exactly which route you take and what time of year you do it in. There are, there are two major influences in the, um, in the uh, departure time uh, and they're both to do with weather. I mean 
firstly you don't want to be getting back to Europe in winter time you don't want to be encountering the gales that uh, start um, around I don't know October November so you want to arrive back before then and you want to be coming out of the uh, West Indies American sea waters before the end of June so May June is the time to be leaving the East Coast America or the um, West Indies waters the most popular route which works best in May or June involves stopping at Bermuda and the Azores so to do that you uh, head up to the Bahamas and from the Bahamas um, you make about an 800 mile passage up to um, Bermuda. Having got to Bermuda take a breath there uh, head out for the Azores which uh, probably take a couple of weeks um, and from the Azores you can then head to the UK you can head up to Bayona again or down to Gibraltar or down to the Straits and into the Mediterranean. You Alternatively, you can set off from Antigua uh, and head directly for the Azores. Um, and friends of mine have done that. It's a it's a trickier route because the winds will come from all directions, and it's probably a route that's suited to bigger boats with with more crew because you're going to be. Uh, it isn't trade wind sailing. There's going to be constant um, constant sail changes and constant alterations in, cor in, in course to get there. But it's doable. Um, it's, it, it's perfectly viable. For my money, I would, um, I would do the route uh, up through the Bahamas, which are absolutely lovely islands to mess around in. I have some great times there. And then I would head up for, uh, head up for Bermuda and go across the Azores from there. So that's my Atlantic crossing video. I'm currently working on a book uh, which I will um, publish on uh, michaelbrown.com and gentlesailing.com as a download uh, because I've got a feeling that it might be useful if you're serious about doing this uh, to have a sort of more accessible um, access to the information uh, if, if you thought it's been useful. So anyway, it'll come out there. Um, if, you if you press my subscribe button, it, once again, I'll be very grateful because um, I would like to grow the channel and um, get it get it up to a reasonable size so that uh, more people see my videos. But uh, you know, if you don't, it really doesn't matter. Have a wonderful Atlantic crossing. Um, see you out there in the Caribbean again. I suspect I, this has reawakened my desire to get back there. Talking about it, fair winds, safe landfalls. Bye.